of power and my subtitle is agendas and games agendas and games in the corridors of power there are agendas and there are power games that are played and one of the reasons why only a few people rise to function in places of power is because sometimes the games are far bigger than them and they are not sure of how to manage the agendas that are at play there. I believe God has called us in this season to rise to places of influence in our places of uh, specialization, in our careers, in our nations, in our workplaces. And I believe that we have to be equipped to fight the battle in those areas. There are three statements I want to make before we even read any scripture uh, today. The first statement, uh, you know it already, but it's important to make us aware of it, that there is a natural world and there is a spiritual world. There is a natural world and there is a spiritual world. The world we live in is not all that there is. It is the natural world. We see it, we live in it, we act in it, and we are familiar with it. But it is not all that there is. There is a real world that we do not see, and it still function. And in that world, there is God, there is Satan. God is a spirit, Satan is also a spirit so there is a natural world and there is a spiritual world second important statement is that the spiritual world influences the natural world they don't live exclusive to themselves these two worlds but the spiritual world influences the natural world we humans think that we are in charge of everything that happens around us but the reality is that our world is subject to the spiritual world. And the third important statement I want you to note is that both God and Satan use people to do their will. Both God and Satan use people to do their will. God uses people, Satan uses people. Many of us know God as good, as kind, and loving. So our mental picture of him is someone who is nice, beautiful, and pleasing. And uh, we know Satan, on the other hand, as evil, as wicked, and destructive. So our image of Satan is nasty, distasteful, and ugly. As a result, we equate Anything that looks nice, beautiful, and pleasing to God. And anything that doesn't look that way, we say, is for Satan. So anytime Satan camouflages himself as nice, beautiful, and pleasing, it is very easy for us to take his work as the work of God because of the image we have of God. And in the corridors of power, the believer must be very aware that there is a spiritual power play going on. In the corridors of power, we must be able to discern what is behind the ideas, the people, the attitudes, or the actions that go on there. And, and today we're going to go back to the book of Daniel and we're going to uh, learn a few things about uh, the agendas and the power play and how to survive in that environment. Daniel chapter 1 verses 3 to 4. We read it the last time, but we'll read it again. And then Daniel chapter 1, verse 8.
Daniel 1, 3 to 4. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Then verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of Enoch that he might not defile himself. In these two passages, we see two different agendas at play. First, we look at Nebuchadnezzar's agenda. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was a man on a mission, a man with a global aspiration. He was a man with a big agenda, and I will try to summarize his agenda in two ways. First, that to impose his worldview and his gods on the world. To impose his worldview and his gods on the world. When the book of Nazar went to conquer nations, he wasn't just doing it politically just to gain land and territory. He also was doing it because he believed that his god or his gods needed to be worshipped by all, all the peoples of the earth. So he was on a spiritual agenda as well, not just a political agenda. Behind the political agenda was a massive spiritual agenda. So he was pushing a spiritual worldview from his spiritual point of view. Now, if you saw Nebuchadnezzar conquering, you would just say, well, this is just another a politician or this is just another king who is trying to uh, take territory but behind him there was an agenda it's very important the second thing was that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to compel all people to bow to his image Nebuchadnezzar understood the power of image he knew how to control people. If, if Nebuchadnezzar lived in our days, we would say he understood branding. He knew the power of branding, how to brand himself. There's no greater brand than to make a golden image of yourself. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3 made a huge golden image of himself and, and, and instructed everybody to bow to that image or to bow to that brand. So Nebuchadnezzar was on a spiritual mission. He was also on an, a mission to impose his brand, to impose his image over the entire world. And he did that by conquering nation after nation and making sure that his philosophy becomes the predominant philosophy. But Nebuchadnezzar was not the only one with an agenda. He had an agenda, but Daniel also had an agenda. Daniel understood that he had uh, been conquered. He understood that he had been defeated. He understood that his people were now slaves. But that didn't stop him from also having an agenda, a purpose. And Daniel's agenda can be summarized in two ways. One, to introduce his God, Yahweh, to Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom or to the Babylonian kingdom. He wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know that Yahweh was the only God and that he ruled in the affairs of men. He saw his presence in Babylon as an opportunity to make his God known in the corridors of power. So although Daniel had been conquered, his people had been conquered, and he had been enslaved, he still carried with him something that said, wherever I go, I would make Yahweh known. 
I would make the God of Israel known. So there's going to be a conflict of agendas. Nebuchadnezzar wants to control Daniel. Daniel wants to control Nebuchadnezzar. Both of them want to control. And behind it, there is a spiritual reason. Nebuchadnezzar is doing it spiritually. Daniel is doing it spiritually. All of them want the God they worship to be the supreme one. So, Daniel's agenda is to introduce Yahweh to Babylon, or the God of Israel to Babylon. And so, he studied the Babylonian system. He walked in the corridors of power. He understood the Babylonian system. But if you watch Daniel throughout, he never bowed to that system. Never bowed to it. Because he understood that he had come to Babylon not to submit to Nebuchadnezzar's agenda, but to perform a different agenda which he believed had been given to him by God. It's very important. The, the second way you can see Daniel's agenda was that Daniel, right from the beginning, wanted to influence the decisions of the king of Babylon. Daniel was determined to outshine and outperform everybody that Nebuchadnezzar listened to. Now, when Daniel went to school in Babylon, he was put in the University of Babylon, and he started his three-year course, and Daniel was determined from day one because it was in that school that the chief policymakers, influencers in Babylon were raised. Daniel understood that, and so right from school, he wanted to come out number one so that when he emerged, he would be in a position to influence what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Sometimes believers do not know why God brings them into the corridors of power. Some see it as a matter of luck or chance. Others see it as a matter of personal advancement but Daniel saw it as a divine assignment. If you are ever going to aspire into the corridors of power, you have to determine before you get there whose agenda you are going to push. Why are you there? Why has God put you in that position? Why are you in that position? Are you just there to better your life? Are you just there because you were lucky? Are you just there because... Uh, you were fortunate, the circumstances of life put you in that place, or you are there because there is a hand that is guiding your movement. For those who know that they get to the corridors of power by an agenda, they are very conscious of everything they do in that place. Now, many times we just want to assume that people are in the corridors of power just for themselves. But my understanding is when people get to the corridors of power, they are either per pursuing God's agenda or Satan's agenda. It's as simple as that. Either pursuing God's agenda or Satan's agenda. Whether they're sitting number 10 down in the street or in the White House or they sit in... Uh, uh, Where's the China one? I don't know how they call it. Or they sit uh, in, in Russia, or they sit at the Flagstaff House, or they sit at Asso Rock. Wherever they sit, they are pursuing an agenda. They may not even be aware of the agenda, but there is a force seeking to dominate humans by using the ideas of those people. So whenever you listen to and watch the news, Anytime a superstar arises, whether as a sports icon, entertainment icon, somebody that the world begins to look up to and listen to, anytime somebody rises in power, anytime a new discovery is made, anytime new social concepts gain prominence, ask yourself this simple question, whose agenda are they promoting? Anytime you see that, all of a sudden, the whole world is doing something else. And I'm not trying to impute evil to anything, 
But all of a sudden, social media becomes powerful, and everybody is Googling, and everybody is FaceTiming, and everybody is Facebooking, and everybody is Instagramming, and everybody is WhatsApping. And, and, and you're wondering, what is it promoting? Don't just look on the world as if things are just happening. Things are not just happening. Things are happening for things to happen. Things are happening for things to happen. And the fact is many times, not always, not always, but many times, sometimes, people whom we like on the world stage may also be at the same time promoting Satan's agenda. Because things are not as simple as they seem. And it's not even a matter of whether the person is a believer or not a believer. A believer may be promoting Satan's agenda and an unbeliever may be promoting God's agenda. Because God uses people. And God finds whom he can use. And Satan is also looking for whom he can use. And when we yield to either of them, we get used by them. So, what is your agenda for desiring to be in the corridors of power. Whom will you serve? Whose agenda will you push? So let's see how Nebuchadnezzar tried to play his agenda. Daniel chapter 1 verse 5 to 7. Daniel chapter 1 verse 5 to 7. Now, this is after Daniel and his companions had been enlisted into the training program of Nebuchadnezzar. They are now in the kings under his control. The Bible says the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them, an educational scholarship, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. To Daniel he gave the name Betelshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. To Azariah, Abednego. So we see Nebuchadnezzar's game. He's doing something very interesting. He wants to expand his rule over these new recruits. And there is a threefold game he's playing. The first one is spiritual. The first is spiritual. He want, and the agenda was to draw Daniel away from his faith. You say, how did he do that? He decided to change what they ate. And if you read it, it, it sounds interesting. It says that uh, the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank. King's delicacies and the wine which he drank. The word delicacy uh, in the original uh, translation means rich food. Rich food food. So, I mean, can you imagine these guys uh, were conquered as a people? They were Jews. They have been conquered. They are slaves. Their other colleagues are probably working in the mines of Babylon. Uh, they are being whipped. They are being mistreated. Some of them are houseboys. But these are the elite. They've been selected. And Nebuchadnezzar says, you are special. And to show you are special, you're going to eat what I eat. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a breakthrough. It sounds like favor. It's like, it sounds like God has already turned your captivity around. It sounds like all of a sudden things are working for you. Not only are you getting uh, good food from the king's table, he's even giving you educational scholarship. But there was a problem. Because Daniel is a Jew. And one of the important things of the Jewish faith was what they ate, whether they ate clean or unclean animals. 
Nebuchadnezzar didn't have that limitation. So Nebuchadnezzar's food mostly would come from what the Jews would call unclean. But it was a delicacy. It was nice. It was good. It was from the king's table. And Daniel had to decide at this point. Am I just going to forget everything I know as right and wrong? Am I just going to forget every law of God I know? And am I just going to say that, well, you know, this is my season. I, and, and I have this opportunity. Let me make the best of it and eat the food. If he ate the food, then he will no longer be a Jew. He will disconnect himself from God's covenant. So this is a spiritual battle. It looks like a food battle, but it's a spiritual battle for the soul of Daniel. To shift him, to change his faith, to change his spiritual life from a Jew to a Babylonian. And it came from the king's table. So that's the first thing that is happening here. There is a spiritual warfare going on for the soul of Daniel and it's coming through nice opportunities that have been made available to him. Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to separate Daniel from his God. The second was intellectual. He gave him training, three-year scholarship. And the idea is to teach Daniel to think like a Babylonian. Learn the language, acquire the skills, and start thinking not as a Jew any longer, but as a Babylonian. So, first, spiritually separated. Second, intellectually separated. The third is cultural. His agenda, the game is to change Daniel's identity and the image. And it had to do with their names, their personal identities. Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, Azariah. Now, those names don't mean much to us because we are Ghanaians and uh, what is Daniel and uh, Azaria. But, you know, in the, in the Jewish language, God was El, El, Elohim or El. Uh, or uh, God's name is either El or Yahweh, Yah. So when you see any Jewish name that has L in it, E-L, either at the beginning or at the end, it is a name that has God in it. It's, it's a name dedicated to God. Uh, or it has A-H-R. It's also a short form of Yahweh. So all the names of the four boys were names related to God. Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Mishael means who is like God. And Azariah means Yahweh will help. Now they were given different names. And all the names they were given had relationship to Babylonian gods. So they are shifting the identity as representing the God of Israel to the God of Babylon. So this is a cultural war going on to change the identity, their self-knowledge from people of God to people of the gods of Babylon. So that's the deal. Now, I don't know what you would do if you were a slave and you went to the king's palace, he gave you his food, he tried to change your name, try to change you to think differently and your colleagues are being whipped at the minefields I think common sense will tell you hey mom must survive <laughs> mom must live so how did Daniel respond to that because Daniel understood 
This is not just change of names going on. This is not just normal food I'm eating. Somebody wants to pollute me. Somebody wants to change the way I think. And somebody wants to change the way I see myself. Unfortunately, I am powerless. I'm not a powerful person here. I belong to a tribe that has been dominated. I don't have much say. I don't have representatives in parliament. I can write to the newspapers. I can report to the police. There's nothing I can do. So how do I fight this powerful force that wants to control me? So let's, let's see how Daniel did it. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 to 10. And it says, we have read it again uh, before, but I'll read it again. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. That's a bold, audacious thinking. Verse 9. Now God brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are at your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. That's a nice phrase. You endanger my head. In other words, what you are asking for will, would, would, would cause me to be beheaded. You, you, are, you are seriously putting not just my job in jeopardy, but my head in jeopardy. So let's look at Daniel's response to Nebuchadnezzar. The first thing we see about Daniel is that he determined to be faithful to God. Daniel kept covenant with God. He purposed in himself, I will not defile myself. He purposed. The way I see it, it meant that Daniel at that point had drawn the line. I will not defile myself. I can do anything else, but I will not deny my God. I will not deny my faith. I will not deny Yahweh. I will not defile myself. I am not in Jerusalem. I'm in Babylon. Nobody will see me. Nobody will watch me. But Yahweh watches over me, and I will not defile myself. He drew the line there. That I will not do anything that separates me from my God. If you're going to walk in the corridors of power and walk with a divine agenda, that's one of the first things you have to do. You have to determine you will not defile yourself. You will not separate your faith from your life. You will not just be a Sunday Christian and a Monday to Friday devil worshiper. I will not defile myself. That's the first thing, determined to be faithful. The second thing we find there is that he developed strategic alliances in that place. The Bible says that he had found favor with the chief of the eunuchs. Now we're not told how long Daniel had been in that place. We're not told how long he had been in the palace. But in that short time, he was in the good books of the chief of eunuchs. I don't know what he did. Maybe Daniel was serviceable. Maybe he went the extra mile to serve the, the king, or the, 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 the chief of the eunuchs. Maybe he was extra obedient. Maybe he was extra bright. But something about him made that man say, this boy is a Jew, but I think there is something about him 
that I want to help him to achieve. I want to help this guy succeed. Because when you are in enemy territory, you need somebody who finds favor with you. That's why you can't go to enemy territory and fight everybody. Already you are in enemy territory. This is not your place. You don't know anybody. So I am sure the first thing Daniel did, and I, I feel one of the ways to find favor with people, is to serve them. Is to serve them. He says, fetch water. You go and fetch 10 gallons of water. He says, Daniel, do this. You go the extra mile. So I think within a very short time, Daniel separated himself from the rest of the gang. Maybe the rest of the Babylonians felt, this is our great opportunity. We're going to be employed as major policy makers. Uh, the Jews, they were probably timid. But Daniel, I'm sure, was, uh, was confident. He was expressive. And for some reason, he built this alliance with this one man in enemy territory. Because it was going to be critical for the next move he made. The next move he made is that Daniel negotiated for a variation of the rules. He did not fight all the rules. He chose the rules that were essential. And he decided how to choose his battles. Don't just let people make rules for you and accept them. Try to negotiate the rules. Ask for space. Rework the deal. Don't just, when people tell you, this is it, take it or leave it, go the extra mile with them. Because it's not always take it or leave it. Sometimes you can negotiate space. And Daniel says, I am in this place. I need space to maneuver. And I have to choose my battles. Three things. Diet, which affects his faith. His mind, training, and his name. Which one am I going to fight? I'm, I can't fight all the three at the same time. So he decides I'm going to fight the one which is most essential to me, my faith. And I'm going to ask for room for me to practice my faith. And I'm going to ask so that my faith will not be hindered. You can change my name and call me whatever you want. I won't call myself that. That's your problem. Because if you look through the book of Daniel, Daniel never called himself Betelshazzar. The Babylonians call him and call him, hey, Betelshazzar. He says, well, that's what you think you are. I'm Daniel. It's like Kunta Kinte. In, uh, in, in slavery, they call him Toby. He says, I'm Kunta Kinte. You think you can change my name? That's your job, but I know who I am. So he's, Daniel felt that's not a battle to fight because that one I can deal with it in my bedroom. You call me, you know, uh, Betel Shaz, I call myself Kuta Kinte. It's, no, it's like you go to, sometimes you go to America, you see a Ghanaian, and, and, and uh, in his office he's called Michael Smith. <laughs> and you know him to be Kwekumeza. <laughs> Now, you dare not go ask, where, where's Kweku <laughs> you know, He's Michael Smith. But he knows himself. He's still Kweku His friends still Kweku Hey, Kweku, Kweku. But in his office, Michael. So that's what Daniel is saying. Well, you can call me Battle Shazza all you want. I'm Daniel. I'm not even going to fight that battle. It's an unnecessary battle. As for the school, I'm going to learn everything you teach me, but I'm not going to bow to it. But the one which is most important to me, I cannot deny my God. So I will negotiate for space to worship my God in enemy territory. Although everybody here is an unbeliever, I'm going to ask for space to serve God. Although nobody here loves God, I'm going to ask for space. So he says to the chief of the eunuch, Sir, you can have all the things you're asking for, but I ask for one thing. I cannot break the rules of God. I cannot deny my faith. 
He didn't put it that way. That's his reasoning. He didn't tell the king, uh, the chief of Eunuch, because if he said that, then they would also think it's a spiritual battle and make it difficult for him. But he says, just try me. Let me eat my diet. Let me eat my diet. And the, and the chief of Enoch says, well, if I give you that space, he didn't even say that other people will ask for the same space because who wants to change the diet from the king's food? Everybody is loving it. But he says, my head will be jeopardized. In other words, if I do this for you, I'm putting my integrity, my life, my, my everything on the line for you. Daniel, is that what you're asking? But can you imagine that a man is ready to even think of doing it for Daniel in this short time? So something has happened about his understanding of Daniel that made him want to go the extra mile for Daniel. He had no business pleasing Daniel but favor will make a way for you. And if there is anything you need in the corridors of power, you need favor. You need God to bring you into favor with people. People who will do you good. Who, people who will open doors for you. People who will give you access. They may even be part of the enemy, but they will give you access. May God bring you to that place where in the corridors of power, God will appoint favor for you favor for you. You will negotiate and get your space. So Daniel chapter 1 verse 11 to 16. It says, so Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs has set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit. So deal with your servants. So he cons consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. I like that. Daniel allowed his faith to be put to the test. He believed that the power of what he carried was so much that he was ready to put it to the test. So he says, test us. Test us. The second thing you notice is that Daniel proved that his faith made him a better person. His faith made him a better person. Because the problem of the chief of eunuchs was, if I let you eat what you want, and the king comes and looks at your faith and see, face and sees that you are lean, then my head is in your body. So Daniel says, put us to the test. They put them to the test for 10 days. And after the 10th day, they saw that their faces looked better, fresher. The word they use is fatter, but I don't think it means bloated, but it meant fresher. They look fresher. They look fresher. They look more nourished. They look better. So Daniel said, the concession you gave to us did not make us weaker. It made us better. That's one of the things you have to put, do in the corridors of power. That when concessions are made for your faith, it makes you better and not weaker. Because, you know, sometimes Christians ask for space. For example, people are in an office. They say, well, we are Christians. We want to have Bible study. 
Then they give you time to have Bible study. Now you're having Bible study during working times. That doesn't make your faith make you a better person. Your faith is making you non-productive. Or you go to an office, you find a Christian. Yeah, they allow you to read your Bible. It's good that they allow you to read your Bible. But now you're reading your Bible during working times and you are costing the company money. Your faith is not making you better. It's making you worse. And when you do that, you jeopardize the person who gave you opportunity. In the corridors of power, when you are given access and you're given opportunity to practice what you believe, you must make sure that you perform 10 times better. 10 times better. You cannot be, I mean, years ago, you know, people would go to scripture union in secondary schools, go to scripture union schools, scripture, go to meetings, 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 no time management, no proper time, and then they go to do O level and, and just bomb. Fail. And then they give a bad name to the scripture union. They say, well, Christians spend all their time praying and praying and praying, and then when it says them, they are failing. No, that's not what Daniel is saying. Daniel says, test us, and our faith will prove to you that we are better people. When we practice our faith, we become better than those who don't practice our faith. Our faith makes us better workers, makes us better producers. Because remember when you were a Christian and God gives you access to a place, you don't just represent yourself. You represent all other Christians who will come after you. So they gave concessions. Look at your output. But in Daniel's case, the Bible says, face was better and Daniel justified the trust that had been placed in him the man put his job on the line for Daniel and Daniel did not let him down if you're going to be a big player on the world stage don't let people down People who put trust in you, don't let them down. Somebody gives you a break, don't let him down. Somebody gives you opportunity, don't let him down. Somebody takes your hand and, and, and justifies trust in you or expresses trust in you, don't let him down. Somebody writes a reference for you for you to get a job, don't let the person down. Somebody picks the phone and calls somebody for a facility to be extended to you, don't let them down. Because they are putting their head on the line for you. The reason why many people never rise to the corridors of power because they disappoint people who trust them. People open door for you, you shut it in their face. People give you opportunity, you mess it up. People help you to get somewhere, you step on them down. Or you go and do something nasty that rubs off on them. But Daniel determined if you open this door for me, you will not be disappointed. You will never regret giving me this chance. You have to make that decision at a very young age that when people give you opportunity, they will never regret giving you opportunity. Otherwise, you will not go far in life. Because in this world, somebody will open a door for you. There are many doors you can open, but there are certain doors you are so surrounded by enemies that there is no helper. And then all of a sudden, somebody picks up a phone and that gives you that break. Don't go and mess up. Don't go and mess up. Don't go and fail. Don't go and, and disappoint. Don't go and, and do something that somebody will pick up the phone and call that guy back and say, hey, the man, the, 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 the guy you, you recommended, look at what he has done. Not only does it affect you, but they will not trust him again. 
It can cost him his job. It can cost him his own doors. It can cost him his own opportunities. It can cost him so much. When people open doors for you, don't disappoint them. So, the chief of the eunuchs now has more confidence. He says, Daniel, I love you guys. You, 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 you these Hebrews, I don't know what you've been eating. I don't know what you worship. But it looks like whatever you practice doesn't make sense, but it's working. It's like you're, you're out there speaking in tongues. And people say, it doesn't make sense. But it looks like the more tongues you pray, the better you work. The, the more you meet your targets, the more you are able to perform, the more you are able to, to achieve your results. The next time somebody comes speaking in tongues, they will believe in him. Because you have shown that speaking in tongues is not a liability, is an asset in the workplace. That is what Daniel showed, that in the corridors of power, faith is an advantage. That when we serve God, it works well for us. And the final verse we read, Daniel, this is how this whole of chapter 1 ends. I like it. Daniel chapter 1 verse 18. Now at the end of the days, this is the third year final exam. At the end of the days when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar is the chief examiner. He's uh, sitting at the panel of the interview. Verse 19, then the king interviewed them. And among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Daniel outshined and outperformed his competition. He was 10 times better. It's a figure of speech, meaning he was way above everybody. He was far better. He didn't eat the king's food, but he was far better. He didn't bow. He was far better. If God's purpose will be served, it will be served by believers who are ten times better than their competition. We must be ten times better. We must be 10 times better in the classroom. We must be 10 times better in the office. We must be 10 times better in our businesses. 10 times better. Because if you cannot be 10 times better than them, then you cannot be better. You cannot pursue God's agenda. Because they would then be pursuing whatever agenda they are pursuing. If you go to all the major universities in the world, where all the ideas in the world are generated, some good, some bad, some ugly, professors in all the major departments, philosophy departments, psychology departments, determining lifestyles, determining whether a person is gay and uh, whether he's born that way or he learns it, all of that. How do you think the world determines all of those things, whether a man and a man can marry a woman and a woman? How, do, you, do you think they just get up and determine that, no, there are some people, professors, who come up with those theories, and those theories stand on challenge, and then they rule in the affairs of the world. So you may find 10 years ago something everybody said was wrong. 10 years later, everybody says it's right because some professor came with a theory. The question is, where were the believers? If their unbeliever 
outperforms the believer, he will pursue his agenda. If the believer outperforms the unbeliever, the believer will also perform or pursue his agenda. It's a world of agendas. There's a power play going on. So we must have Christians. I know everybody wants to be a businessman and it's great. But we need Christians who control ideas. Professors. Get your PhDs. Get PhD in philosophy. It's a powerful course. It may not earn you money, but you will control the world. Psychology. They are the ones controlling everything now. Because they come with the theories that justify human behavior. We have to be ten times better. We cannot be in the corridors of power until we are ten times better. Daniel outshine, outperform his competition. He made himself an inevitable resource to the king. Since the king was the interviewer, he had to take note of Daniel. He was unavoidable. He was, his success was so overwhelming that although he's a Hebrew, the king couldn't help it. He had to employ him. He was inevitable. Because if you are ten times better, you may not be the most handsome person in the world. The world will take note of you. People who don't like you will have to quote you. People will have to buy your ideas. People will have to buy your research findings. People will have to deal with you because you are ten times better. So the king couldn't do much about it. The guy is sitting in your face. You interviewed him. He's smarter than your own children. He's smarter than your cousins and nephews and nieces, than all your bosses' children, all your professors' children. He's smarter than all your magicians. You brought in your astrologers. You brought all of them, and Daniel and his gang beat them all. The king has no option to say, if I need advice the next time, I know whom to talk to. I'm not going to talk to that magician because Daniel floored him. I'm not going to talk to that astrologer, Daniel floored him. If I need advice, I know which company to talk to, which consultancy to go to, because those Christians out there, they speak in tongues, but I tell you, they are 10 times wiser, 10 times more knowledgeable. They don't seem to be wise spiritually. They don't seem, they're speaking tongues and they're going to church and saying hallelujah, but when you look at their output... You look at their work, you check their report, you check what they have produced, you check their companies. They are ten times better. Nebuchadnezzar had no option. So from that day, Daniel established himself firmly in the corridors of power. The Bible says, that they served before the king. And if you read the rest of the book of Daniel, in fact, chapter 2, the king has a dream. He can't interpret it. He doesn't understand what it means. So he says, calls all his top advisors, all the security couples, everybody who is anybody. He says, I have had a dream. I can't figure it out. You have to figure it out for us, for me. I need interpretation for this. They say, well, king, well, we can. Just tell us the dream. He says, that's the problem. I won't tell you the dream. So you, I won't tell the dream. You have to go figure out what the dream is and what the interpretation is because you guys have been lying to me all these years. I tell you the dream and then you use some little conniving and correlation to tell me all kinds of stories which are not true. Now I will see what you really know. Tell me the dream. Tell me the interpretation. They said, this has never been done. He said, well, that, that is the test. Tell me the dream. 
I mean, the interpretation or otherwise your head is off. I like those guys. Your head will go just now. <laughs> it's not that when they say you are fired, it's not you are sacked. I mean, they are burning you, really. <laughs> so, so, so all the wise men, they, they are perplexed. They don't know what to do. So the killing stars, they start killing all these intellectuals and philosophers and astrologers. So the executioner knocks on Daniel's door and says, you know, we're killing all your kind, all of you educated people who don't have any solution. We're killing all of you. He says, why are you killing us? He says, well, the king asked for a solution and, and your colleagues couldn't provide it. And since you are junior in rank now, they've started killing from the top. It's now reached your end. So, 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 so Daniel says, oh. Don't worry about that. Yes, I'll go and pray about it and I'll give you an answer. So tell the king, I'll talk to my God and I'll come and talk to him. So he goes to pray about it, talks to his colleagues. They go to pray about it. Who gets policy from prayer? Well, Christians get policy from prayer. Who gets ideas from speaking in tongues? We speak in tongues and we get ideas. We pray in the spirit and God gives us inspiration. Don't underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. So Daniel prayed and he told the chief executioner, tell the king, stop killing people. Stop killing these guys. I will come and talk to him. And so he stands before the king. And the king says, can you do it? He says, yeah, I'm ten times better. I can do it. He says, oh, king, this is the dream you had. Po, 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 tells him the dream. And afterwards, this is the interpretation. And afterwards, the king bows and says, there is no God than the God of Daniel. The God of Daniel rules over my gods. Ladies and gentlemen, the agenda of Daniel ruled over the agenda of Nebuchadnezzar. And the agenda of the believers of this time shall rule over the agendas of this world. We have to keep our faith strong. And we have to go out there because we are the people of God. We are ten times better. God bless you. Lift up your hands to heaven. Lift up your hands. Let's talk in the spirit. Just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. Because God wants to bring you to a place where praying in the spirit is not just talking in a language you can't understand. Praying in the spirit is going to give you inspiration. It's going to give you understanding. New policy ideas. New strategic ideas. New innovative ideas. Pray in the spirit, in your prayer, in your dream, in your vision. Just pray and just say, Holy Spirit, inspire me. 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 The inspiration of the Almighty. 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 Gives us understanding. And so, Father, we pray. That you raise up in this place men and women in the corridors of power who will be found ten times better in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord praise somebody.